Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode here on Peter Herman Adventures. Today I'm going to talk to you about uh, all the different salmon fishing regulations that we have in British Columbia and hopefully it will clarify the whole deal to a lot of you new anglers and maybe for some experienced people it's a little bit of a refresher. It's uh, Before I dive into it I'd like to just throw a couple little messages out there. Please keep our rivers clean, pick up everything, including the little bits of leader and the little bits of wool and your little row bags. There's so many people on the river now, everybody litters just a little bit. It really adds up and all that stuff ends up as microplastics in our oceans and our oceans really don't need that. My second message is uh, please support your local tackle stores. They're the ones that are getting involved in local habitat restoration and conservation efforts and local fishing derbies. And their overheads are much higher, so yeah, they're gonna be a, a couple of dollars more expensive than, say, Amazon. But um, they're the ones who really need your help and uh, you want those stores to be there when you need something in a hurry. So my local go-to here in Chilliwack is Fred's Custom Tackle. I've learned a lot from those guys over the years and they've always been there to help me out. Now let's get right into the fishing regulations. So it's a little bit daunting when you get into fishing, all the fishing regulations that you have to know and read. And hopefully this video will get you on your way. But this video is not a replacement for your own responsibility to read and understand the regulations. I can't possibly go into every single little detail of you know everything in British Columbia, so I'm just going to hit the important stuff and the things that people generally get confused about. So the first thing you need to do when you want to go out and fish for salmon is buy a freshwater fishing license. That's available at uh, any government agent, your local tackle stores, or you can also buy one online. If you want to keep salmon, then you also need to buy what's called a conservation stamp. So that's a supplemental fee that you need to pay on top of your license, and that allows you to retain salmon and um, take them home and eat them. If you're under the age of 16, then you don't need a license or the supplemental stamp in British Columbia. It gets a little complicated with minors because um, it isn't just if you're under 16 you need no license. If you're under 16 and a resident of British Columbia, then you don't need your license and you get your own limit of fish. And uh, if you're a minor under the age of 16 and you're not a resident of British Columbia, then you don't need a license to go fish, but you need to be accompanied by a license holder and your daily quota becomes part of their daily quota. So you're entitled to fish without a license, but you don't get your own limit if you're not a resident of British Columbia. Um, once you have your license and you're ready to head out, there are two sets of regulations that you need to be aware of and follow. That's what makes things so complicated. In British Columbia, fishing in general is administered by the province, and there's a British Columbia set of regulations. Uh, but salmon fishing specifically is administered federally by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and they have their own set of regulations on top of the BC fishing regulations. You need to follow both sets and both sets of regulations are available in paper or they're available online. I will provide all the necessary links in the comments below uh, in the description for the video or you can scroll down there and you will find links to both the BC Freshwater Regulation Synopsis and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Salmon Fishing Regulations. Those salmon fishing regulations are they're, um, specific to the area that you fish. So when you go to that website, you need to look up the region that you're fishing and the body of water that you're fishing and figure out your exact regulations and limits that apply to you. It um, gets kind of complicated. Generally speaking, in British Columbia, if you're looking under provincial regulations, 
if you don't see your body of water listed, then you can just assume that it's open and that it doesn't have any special restrictions and you can go fish there. Of course, the DFO regulations is the exact opposite. Only the bodies of water that are listed in their regulations are open to salmon fishing. So if you don't see your local little creek there as being open for salmon fishing, then you're not allowed to go there and fish for salmon. So if your little river or your little creek has some salmon in it, um, and you don't see it listed, it doesn't mean that no special regulations apply. It means that it's not open for salmon fishing. So, um, yeah, let's get into the limits, the daily possession limits, and then I'm going to cover allowable gear and allowable fishing methods. Possession limits also vary by river and they vary by region, but generally the, the main overarching limit is you're only allowed four salmon per day. In the regulations, you will see listed, as for example here, today we're on the Vedder River. On the Vedder River, you will see that you're allowed to keep four clipped hatchery coho, two adult springs over 62 centimeters long, and uh, up to four uh, jack springs, which are springs smaller than 62 centimeters. You're also allowed to keep one chum. Um, so that's a whole bunch of numbers. But when you combine them all, you're only allowed to take home four salmon. So for example here, if you were to catch two coho, two hatchery clip coho, uh, one adult chinook, and one jack chinook, that's your daily limit, that's the maximum you're allowed to keep. If you're camping overnight, then you're allowed to go out fishing the second day, and you're allowed to catch more fish. Uh, you had better be able to prove that you were out camping and uh, you are allowed to have more than your four fish in your cooler. But so you, you're, you're allowed to have in your possession two daily limits if you're staying somewhere overnight. At your permanent residence, you're allowed to have as many fish in your freezer as you've caught that year. There is no possession limit at your primary residence. I hope that clarifies the possession limits you know, to sum it up, okay, four salmon maximum, and there can be a combination of fish up to the various species limits. So just because you're allowed to four salmon doesn't mean you're allowed four coho and two chinook and one chum. It's a, it's a combination of those up to four fish. I want to mention also the situation with the adult Chinooks. Adult Chinooks are fish that have come back after four or five years in the ocean and every region has its own specific size for what what defines an adult Chinook. Here on the Vedder River it's 62 centimeters measured from the tip of the snout to the fork of the tail. Uh, some regions up north that's 65 centimeters, other rivers that's 50 centimeters and uh, so you have to check your specific river. Uh, jacks or jack springs are fish that come back after three years. They're always male fish and they're very important to the species because they mix the genetics between the various years of runs so that one annual run doesn't get completely isolated species-wise from the other runs. Um, these fish are mature but they've come back after three years. They will spawn in the river and then die just like all the other fish but um, they're, they're a bit small. And uh, so there, in most rivers, you have a separate limit for jacks and a separate limit for adults when it comes to springs. For springs, you also have an annual limit. So you're allowed up to 10 Chinook salmon. And you'll see I'm using the term Chinook and spring interchangeably. They are the same fish. Uh, the Americans down south call them kings. Um, and some people, if, if the fish is over 30 pounds, call them a tai. They're all the same fish, just different names for it. So your annual limit for springs is 10. So every time you catch an adult spring, as defined by the size, you have to immediately write it down on your license. I don't know if you can see my license very well. Um, you always need to carry a license on you when you're fishing and picture ID. 
So when you catch, I don't think this has any of my personal information on this part. So when you catch a salmon, or a Chinook I should say, you have to immediately write it down in your license and you'll see how I've done that there. It's region two. You'll see there that I caught one this morning. If there's a fish on the beach and nobody's got it written in their license, the conservation officers can not only find you, they can confiscate that fish and your fishing gear. So as soon as you're done bleeding the fish, take a few minutes, write it down in your license. And uh, 10 springs for a year, that's a lot of fish. Here on the Vetter, the springs I catch, they average about 15 pounds. Some of them are 12, some of them are 20. They're big fish. Uh, one spring is usually about four dinners for my family, and that's, um, there's five of us, so that's a lot of fish. Uh, if I catch 10 adult springs in a year, and a couple of jacks, right there, it's 40 or 50 fish dinners. And so those limits are quite generous. So we've covered possession limits, daily and annual. Now let's go into allowable fishing methods. All streams, sloughs, and um, basically any moving, in British, moving water in British Columbia, you need to use a single barbless hook. Um, you also need to use a single barbless hook for fishing for salmon. And I snorkel in the river a lot and I find a lot of barbed gear. In some places I go, it's like half of it has barbs or poorly pinched barbs. So I don't know how clearly you guys can see this on the, on the video here. There are many hooks sold that are barbless to begin with. If you are pinching your own barb, then you better make sure that it's pinched completely flat. What the conservation officers will do is they will poke that hook through a shirt or similar piece of cloth and oh, let's pick a different one. So here's another hook. This is one I found on the river. So they will take it, they will poke it through a piece of cloth and then they'll pull it out. If it pulls out clean, it's barbless. If it doesn't, it's barbed. Even if the little barb on there is minuscule, if it hangs up in thread, it's a barbed hook and you will get a fine for it. All right, so that covers barbless hooks. Uh, the barbless hooks are important because they don't really make your fish harder to catch. I very rarely lose a fish because the hook fell out. Sometimes I lose fish because um, it, you know, it rips through the little bit in the mouth and it, it just pulls out or the fish rips my leader. But once you learn how to play these salmon, you keep constant pressure on them you will not lose fish because your hook does not have that little barb on them. Um, it, uh, the hooks are important because, of course, they allow you to release fish that you're not allowed to keep uh, quickly and easily without harm to the fish. Also, when you break a fish off, uh, that fish will, able to shake, will be able to shake that hook and uh, get rid of it and that hook will not harm its chances of spawning. So single barbless hook, there's that. Um, I'm gonna wade right into the very controversial topic of flossing and snagging. S flossing uh, refers to a method of fishing where you're floating a leader uh, with, or with a, a small piece of bait on there close to the bottom where the fish are holding. And what you're hoping for is that fish is swimming upstream, breathing, and you're hoping to sort of pass the leader through its mouth and then as it pulls through, it catches the fish in the mouth. Uh, flossing under BC regulations is not illegal, but snagging is. Snagging is when you combine that or other methods along with an aggressive hook set. So you'll see this unfortunately happen a lot. Um, some of the less ethical fishermen out there will sort of drift their presentation through where the fish they're holding and then whether they get a bite or not, yank their hook and set it really hard. Um, it's difficult for the conservation officers to prosecute that because the angler can always claim that they had a bite. But 
it, it results in foul hooked fish. So under BC regulations, it says so on page 96 or 97 of the synopsis, they define what a foul hooked fish is. Um, you, uh, the fish has to be hooked in the mouth. It doesn't specify whether the hook is on the outside of the lip or the inside of the lip, but it has to be hooked in the mouth. It's a very common misconception out here on the river that uh, the fish needs to be hooked anywhere on the head. Technically, that is not correct. Uh, it's defined very clearly in the regulations as having to be hooked in the mouth. So that's one of those kind of misnomers that you hear a lot on the river. If it's in the head, it's dead. Well, it's not true. It has to be actually hooked in the mouth. So on top of the head, under the gill plates, doesn't count. Foul hooking under BC regulations is defined as uh, hooking the fish in any other part of the body than the mouth and attempting to foul hook a fish is illegal. So um, there's the distinction there. Flossing, you're not making the fish bite, you're just passing the leader through its mouth and catching it that way. Snagging or foul hooking uh, or attempting to is illegal and um, you can get a ticket for it. Um, let's cover uh, another topic that gets people confused or one that's kind of misconceived uh, a lot is uh, party fishing. So that's when you have several people fishing together and you, um, you know, there's this kind of thing that goes on where one fisherman will catch fish for somebody else in their party. That is also illegal. When you catch your own limit, you're done keeping fish, you can't just give your fish to other people. Um, same thing if you have kids along. Your kids don't need a license, but you can't just have your kids make up part of your possession limit. So if you've caught your four fish for the day, you can't catch a fifth and say, oh, that's my kid's fish. Uh, if you want your kid or your buddy to keep that fish, what you have to do is you have to hook the fish and then immediately pass that rod off to your kid or your buddy and have them reel it in. So the DFO's view on that is the person who did the majority of the work landing that fish, reeling it in, is the person who gets to count it on, on their own. And so there is a way around it. If you're hooking a lot of fish and um, your kid maybe doesn't have the ability to hook them or your buddy doesn't have the know-how, uh, you can uh, give them your rod as soon as you hook the fish and have them reel it in. That's legal, but um, handing off your fish to somebody else is not. You can give away fish. The fish that are part of your daily limit, say you have four fish on the beach and you only want to take home three, you are allowed to give it to your buddy or you're allowed to give it to somebody who just happens to be walking by. But you need to give him a letter stating uh, where the fish was caught and your phone number and your information and the date and they have to take that letter with them. So if they get checked on the way home from the river, the conservation officers can call you and say, hey, did you catch that fish and give it to this person? And you'll say, yeah, I did. So that's how uh, hardy fishing works. So what else is there? Daylight hours. That's another one that commonly confuses people. You're allowed to fish for normal fish under BC regulations, with the exception of uh, parts of the Fraser River, Harrison, and Pitt Rivers, where there is no fishing at all allowed at night. On most other rivers, you're allowed to fish in the dark if you choose to. It's not very productive, but you can fish in the dark. Uh, for salmon, though, if you're, if you're targeting salmon, it has to be what's considered daylight hours and the uh, Department of Fisheries defines that as one hour before official sunrise to one hour after official sunset and you'll find that the people on the river here especially the vetter take that very seriously so um, happened to me a couple of years ago I didn't have my cell phone on me I went out early morning started fishing and right away I got yelled at it was about five minutes before the official one hour before official sunrise. Official sunrise is different every day. So, you know, it gets one or two minutes later every day. So what you need to do is you need to look at the weather network or some other official source. And you need 
to figure out when that sunrise is and you're allowed to start casting one hour before the official sunrise. And same thing goes for sunset, of course it's just an hour after the official sunset. Uh, those tend to be the best times to fish, so it's, it's a good time to be out on the river. It's called first light. And that, that is that moment, one hour before official sunrise, when everybody starts casting their floats out, even though they can't see them properly yet. Um, so I think that that covers most of the sort of misunderstood or controversial regulations. Um, you do need to check the regulations frequently. I would recommend checking the regulations on the DFO site, so the Department of Fisheries, as I provided in the link below. You need to check those every single time you go out because they make frequently in-season regulation changes and they don't give a lot of notice. This happened last year, about uh, this time of year, kind of beginning of October, they suddenly realized that they were having a poor return of chum and the notice went out, effective, effective noon tomorrow, there is no retention for chum. And I, up to a week later, I still saw people out there killing chum you have to be up to date and aware of those regulation changes. So if you don't follow social media a lot and then, you know, you're know you kind of a little bit maybe out of touch, please consult the website every time you go out so that uh, you're aware of any in-season regulation changes. Okay, what else do we need to talk about? There's a lot to cover. You know, there, there are a lot of little fine detailed points as, as to what you are and allowed, are not allowed to do. You just read the front of the synopsis for provincial wide regulations and it'll give you all the allowable fishing methods and all the illegal fishing methods. So, you know, some, some areas have a bait dam, some areas don't. So, for example, here on the Veda River, you're allowed to put uh, bait oils on your, on your row. So, like, you know, you have a... This is a, a little um, anise scented oil that I like to put on my beads and on my row. Sometimes I use krill too. Um, so if there is no bait ban, you're allowed to do that. You're also allowed to fish row and worms and um, you know whatever kind of whatever you want. You're not allowed to use uh, finfish or parts of finfish unless you're fishing for sturgeon in the Fraser River. That's kind of one major limitation. Um, where there is a bait ban, and that applies to a lot of rivers in BC. You're not allowed to use any artificial scents and you're not allowed to use any natural materials. So you're not allowed to use worms. You're not allowed to use um, scented beads and uh, things like power bait that are manufactured. You're not allowed to use row. So um, if you're fishing in an area with a bait ban, like for example, the Capilano River in North Vancouver, you're not allowed to have any sort of scent or artificial or, or real on any of your gear. Um, other things that apply maybe to salmon fishing are, is the use of lights. You're not allowed to use any light to attract the fish uh, unless it's attached within one meter of your hook. So you see some guys when they're fishing first light they put little glow sticks on top of their floats so see if they can see them better. If that glow stick is um, less than a meter from the hook that's fine. Uh, I also sometimes use clear drift uh, glow beads so they're kind of like you shine your headlamp on them and they, they, they glow in the dark for a few minutes and I use those to kind of catch the fish's attention in the early morning when it's still a little bit dark. That's perfectly legal but you're not allowed to build a fire right next to the water and try and attract fish that way or, or shine a light in the water and uh, attract them. Now there may be a little clarification. Um, the video is getting rather long. I think I've kind of lost everybody by now. If there is some little point that you would like clarified, by all means leave me a comment and uh, I promise I will get back to you. Um, but um, I'm not an official government licensed person of any sort. Um, if you want to hear it straight from the source, you can call the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Information Line. There's also a provincial one. Easy to find online. Just Google it and you can call them directly. Uh, 
remember, I'm, I'm explaining the regulations, but I'm not giving you legal advice. If you ever get a ticket and you say, well, this Peter guy on YouTube, he, he said that it's okay. Well, <laughs> I'm afraid the judge won't really uh, put much weight on that. So it is still your responsibility to check the regulations and figure it out. Um, I'm just putting this video out there because I spend a lot of time on internet forums. It's kind of a hobby of mine and uh, there's a lot of contradictory information that flies around out there and um, a lot of misconceptions. So if you ask these questions online, you're bound to get confusing or misleading answers. The best thing to do is to pick up the phone, call the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and have them explain it to you. So thank you very much for watching and uh, my next videos might be more fun. I'm gonna do some about actual salmon fishing Probably not actual like fishing fishing videos, but I'm planning some you know, explaining how to get a little better at catching coho and how to get a little better at catching springs. So yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.